One of my favorite strategy games of all time is about to merge with what is objectively the greatest game of 2023, so you better be paying attention. My name is Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman, and welcome back to the channel. Hello everyone! If you enjoy what I do, including coverage of brand new strategy RPGs like the stellar Guild Saga Vanished Worlds, then a like on this video and a subscription to the channel would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Also, thank you to Ocelot Studios and Vicarious PR for sponsoring this video. It means the world, and I'm being very literal when I say that kind of support is what keeps the channel running. That said, I want to be very clear, all thoughts and opinions in this video are my own. So. If you're interested in anything you see here today, I have links to the game Steam page in the description. I encourage you to go check it out, see what you think, and if you're at all intrigued, consider maybe picking it up and supporting the devs. Thank you very much. And yes, this is a glorious day indeed, my friends, because, as mentioned, Guild Saga Vanished Worlds is out right now on Steam. If you're watching on release, that would be October 10th, 2024, and I'm extremely excited about it. If you didn't know and you missed my original video about it back in February, which you can check out if you'd like, here's the brief. Guild Saga Vanished Worlds is a really slick strategy RPG from indie devs Ocelot Studios. It's a pixel-style blend of RPG juggernaut Baldur's Gate 3 and the grid-based, turn-based strategy beauty of Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. If you're a long-time viewer of this channel and that pitch somehow doesn't get your blood pumping, well, you better check that you have a pulse because this, this is one to pay attention to. You want turn-based tactical combat? Oh, we got it. You want deep character customization, blending melee, range, and spellcasting of all varieties? Well, we got that too. Maybe you want myriad quests, explorable maps, hidden secrets and treasures, and characters who not only have distinct personalities, but will also remember how you treat them and act accordingly later in the story? You're damn right we got that. And all of that with great music, stylish animations, and a world that has some very intriguing lore behind it, which we'll talk about a little bit later down the line. It's a good time. Today, we're going to go through, break down everything I've experienced with the game thus far, its basic design tenets, how it feels to play, differences between the full release and the demo, and my thoughts on the new content that exists past where the demo ended. Keep in mind, this is not a full review, and of course, the game is in early access, so things are subject to change. Think of this as more of an extended impressions and overall game introduction video. Now, with all that out of the way, let's start with a quick overview. Our story takes place on the continent of Ard, and we feature as the leader of a small team of adventurers escorting a pilgrimage to a new land. After a storm shipwrecks the expedition, it falls to us and our team to strike out, find the resources the pilgrims need to survive, and the target of their search. The fallen bodies of, and I'm going to butcher these, Ogier and Vagalianir, yeah, we'll go with that, servants of the god of light Aldric, who were very, and I mean very, recently slain by the shadows of evil. We're talking like days here. And that's reason number one, honestly, why I'm so interested in the story of Guild Saga. Events are unfolding now, not in the distant past. And yeah, of course, you're going to say like, oh, well, yeah, any game that you're playing, the events are unfolding now. That's why it's a game. It's a story and you're the main character. That's not what I mean. Think to how many other games you've played, fantasy, sci-fi, whatever, where major godly conflicts happened in the past that are so old they've been consigned to history and myth, but the effects of which have shaped the world that you're now playing through. And yeah, you might deal with some of the echoes of that, and it's probably going to be something that winds up coming up in some form or fashion as you proceed through the game, but it doesn't tend to be happening literally now in guild saga it's happening literally now and to me it makes it so much easier to get invested in these types of grand tales featuring gods fighting evil especially when you're a mere mortal so you're joined on the journey at first by a bubbly elfin druid asuka and studious spellblade luciette with other characters like the roguish pirate leora joining along the way as well as of myriad other characters each of these party members is fully customizable not just your own character and speaking of that, overview kind of handled, I think we should probably talk mechanics, abilities, and character building. While I reference Baldur's Gate 3 as one half of the formula that has brought us Guild Saga, I do so mainly due to its household name. Functionally, while Baldur's Gate 3 shares a lot of similarities in gameplay mechanics, what you'll really find here 
is much closer to that of Divinity Original Sin 2, the previous title from Larian Studios. We're talking about action points, different schools of magic and martial skill, all sorts of elements and terrain interactions, and a major focus on physical and magical armor and the depletion of such to be able to deal health damage and apply status effects. Combine that with the grid-based, line-of-sight, terrain navigation combat style of FFT and Tactics Ogre, and you get a very interesting combination of two of my favorite styles of RPG. There's also a major focus on team cohesion as a result of this, with your choices for every character in the party and how you develop their classes being largely dependent on what you're going for with the group as a whole. During character creation, you're given free reign to select what stats you want to focus on, what skills and spells you want to be the basis of your class, what other skills and background sort of lore details you might have, and even what your race will be. Now, of course, that last one, even the rest, probably aren't too surprising, of course, in games like this. Typically throw a bevy of races at you, as well as different class options and things. However, these choices can be important beyond just mechanical application, as they're very likely to impact how NPCs treat you throughout the game, and potentially what different dialogue options or other sorts of actions you can take as you proceed, beyond just your general character actions in the dialogue. In my original run of the demo, I rolled a demon, dual spect, and archery, and necromancy, which made for a really sweet combat experience with lots of area denial and pet summoning to keep enemies away from me while I would jump away and snipe things. This time, I decided to take a different approach. White, human, male, fighter, with a longsword. It's bonkin' time, ladies and gentlemen. It's all melee and armor up here, all day, every day. I spec'd everything into being a warrior and hitting hard. I have no range, nor any magic to speak of, yet you have to see how things progress, of course. And while I generally wouldn't recommend limiting yourself in this way when you can be more versatile, I wanted to see how much power you can get if you're more focused. And the answer is quite a bit. I'm still early in my run, about seven hours in at this point, but when my fighter gets on something, he slaps. And it's nice to see that Guild Saga is willing to reward very narrow, focused gameplay in this way. Of course, I do rely a lot on support from the rest of the party members, so we should talk about how they function as well. As far as the party is concerned, versatility fully on display here. Druid Asuka comes rocking Earth Magic, healing and support abilities, or the ability to switch to a bow and play a more classic ranger type. Spellsword Luciette is happy playing the sword and board frontline knight, with a little bit of wind magic here and there to give himself some buffs or have a couple of ranged damage options. Or you can switch him over to a staff and an orb to go full on wind sorcerer at range and he'll be more than happy. And then Rogue Liora, who you recruit a little way into the early game, can do all of your classic assassination things, jumping behind targets, getting backstabs for extra crit, dual wielding daggers, that type of thing. Or you can switch her to a proper Hydromancer at range and have all sorts of support abilities, AoE suppression abilities, healing, and the like. These are just really a few scant examples of the different builds you can make. You've got fire magic, wind magic, earth magic, water magic, light magic, dark magic, melee, range, engineering, which I haven't really played with. Like, There's just so many different things going on here. It's really nice how open your gameplay possibilities are and how, from what I've seen thus far, the game is pretty adept at handling pretty much any choices that you're making. Now, keeping all these possibilities in mind and keeping your options varied and open is absolutely vital, as all enemies do have different weaknesses and resistances, elements that they're taking more damage from or even absorbing to heal, and you'll also need to be able to break both physical and magical armor of varying quantities to be able to actually get at an enemy's vulnerable health. You will also need to be able to play with terrain. That's going to become very important. You know, if there's a ton of water laying around a particular map, you want to be able to hit it with lightning to damage and stun things. If there's a lot of dangerous melee fighters. You're going to want to be able to summon a dust cloud or in some other way navigate the terrain by putting down traps or boulders to keep them from getting at you. There's a lot of things you're going to need to consider beyond just raw damage dealing to interact with the world around you. Of course, having four different party members does make this need for flexibility much more manageable. And while it might be fun to roll nothing but like a bunch of melee beat sticks for a while, that type of ultra focused gameplay from a party wide standpoint is guaranteed to run you up against some hard counter that is like not impossible, but extremely difficult to overcome. 
As far as moment to moment gameplay is concerned, you're going to be working with relatively low move ranges due to move points, the need to carefully meet out your attacks, make every action point count, and generally trying to be as optimal as you can with every move that you make. Now, what's nice is any unspent points carry over to a cap of six. So you can choose to bank some points for a future explosive turn if you have something a little bit more impactful in mind. Using this mechanic to toss out a basic heal with a melee fighter while you move them into position for their next turn, only to then on that turn use the banked points to unleash like three nasty melee attacks on a priority target feels great when everything comes together and it's definitely a play style that I really enjoy. This is doubly so when you keep in mind that, at least early on, certain ranged attacks are typically line of sight only. This means you need to be lined up directly with your target to hit them with like a fireball or an arrow shot. And there's a couple of exceptions, of course, but there will definitely be times where you just can't get into the position that you need to be to land all of your shots. So being able to bank points for next turn prevents some major FOMO in terms of combat resources. Notably as well, maps are preset. Now, that might seem kind of obvious if you're a fan of things like Final Fantasy Tactics, right? But if you're more into the CRPG, Baldur's Gate, Fallout type deal, this might seem a little odd to you in terms of like being able to navigate. But what you'll find is that while you do explore the world in real time, when you come up to a group of enemies, a battle will start and lock you to the section of the map that's designated as the battle map where the enemies are occupying. Each of these combat areas is a part of the game world, including any terrain or hazards that already existed there, so you can do a little bit of forward scouting with the actual camera, but each one has been built to suit the encounter. This means that you can look a little bit ahead and see, okay, well there's some water here, there's some poison over there, this is the type of enemy we're dealing with, and then kind of customize your party's loadout before you actually trigger the fight to give yourself a little bit of an advantage, which I really enjoy. This static setup idea can lead to some really cool scenarios, like say this nasty boss fight here that we'll be talking about more in depth later, but where I was fighting a bunch of electric dinosaurs that fried me using the water scattered around the arena. While yes, this does mean, because I can hear some of you wondering about this, there is a certain amount of linearity moving forward through the world. It also means that the devs can really ensure that you're engaging with the game's systems and not just trying to cheese everything with a particular overpowered strategy you figured out, which to me leads to a tighter tactical experience. Now, speaking of tighter experiences, Guild Saga does have a few different kind of difficulty options going on and what I would describe as a very healthy difficulty curve, which is what we're going to talk about next. Your two difficulty settings are just your standard mode, what I've been playing on, and a story mode for people who care more about the overall narrative and character interactions and world of the game. Standard for me has progressed quite smoothly thus far. The initial fights against some random jungle beasts run the gauntlet at the start of being basically brain dead simple for anyone who has any experience with this type of game, to putting you in more of a position where you need to properly cover your back and move your guys around to land your shots. Now, where it gets interesting is once more human enemies enter who have the same types of skills as you. Then, the threat of losing a character to a flurry of backstabs from rogues or a bunch of crossbow shots from a ranger while they summon some sort of pet or beast to come attack you is definitely much bigger. And if you're like me, you'll catch yourself using your healing abilities or even a potion or two to get through some of these fights relatively unscathed. Finally, by the time you pass through the first major city of the game, you'll start running into some like really actually nasty enemies and encounters that make the full use of terrain effects and target fire on your guys. Take, for example, the previously mentioned lightning dinosaur fight that I showed briefly. That fight wiped my team three, four times, and even once I did beat them, I had burned a significant stock of potions and red scrolls to get it done. There's definitely things that I could have optimized more, but... It was really cool because I was able to figure out a very like careful positioning setup using a bunch of earth magic to take advantage of the weaknesses of the lightning dinosaurs while also being able to blind them and kind of cancel out the storms that they were summoning with a sandstorm and then focusing down priority targets who would then be running away and healing. How are they running away and healing, you might ask? Well, turns out the AI is pretty smart in Guild Saga. And it knew to make use of puddles of electrified water on the ground that it would run the dinosaurs through either on the way to attacking me or running away from me as often as possible because each step that they took through these electrified puddles would actually heal the dinosaurs <laughs> because they absorbed lightning damage. And we're not just talking like, oh, the AI was smart enough to have proper pathing with this. Like, No, there was times where it literally just couldn't get a dinosaur to me to attack me 
So rather than just like wasting its turn doing nothing, it would burn action points to dash to get extra movement and then just run in a circle in a puddle of electrified water to get as much HP back as possible before banking the rest of its points and then coming at me later with more attacks. It was distressingly intelligent. As soon as I realized what was happening here, I audibly groaned because the fight was already hard enough. But I have to say, objectively speaking, from an appreciating game design point, it was a really cool and smart design, and it immediately made me more engaged with what was happening when I realized the kind of caliber that I was dealing with. This wasn't just like a stat check or an element check. There was intelligent stuff going on here, and I had to figure out how to handle that, and it was awesome. I really can't wait to see, after that fight in particular, what other encounters like this I wind up running into down the line. Now, one of the things that I was the most worried about in my time with the demo of Guild Saga Vanished Worlds was the potential linearity and simplicity of map exploration. It's something I praised in my previous video, and there is something to be said for that kind of streamlined exploration process as you push forward into the story. But given the nature of the game, you really need a lot more to sink your teeth into, in my opinion, as you progress. Let me tell you, I'm no longer concerned about that. Once you progress past the initial demo space that functions basically as a tutorial, you'll find yourself immediately entering your first major hub area, a sprawling town that you can truly get yourself lost in. There's multiple buildings to enter, different quest lines to start, tons of NPCs to talk to either to get quests, find items, or just get a bunch of lore and flavor text about the game. You can really get yourself lost here. It's kind of like one of the most CRPG style town experiences I've had in a while. You know, up until you get to Baldur's Gate itself in BG3. And I, I probably spent three hours walking around this town alone, learning as much as I could about the world, shopping, picking up what had to be over half a dozen new quests to explore at my leisure, and just immersing myself in the world. It felt phenomenal. And this is just the first town in the game. I can only imagine how much bigger they might wind up getting. You wind up encountering religious zealots of the water goddess Undyne, to a beleaguered but generally good-hearted general fighting for the people, to a shady group of plague mask wearing quote unquote doctors who are offering free treatment to anyone seeking it. It's a town that really feels alive, and that's so cool. Eventually, I earned the right to pass through town, and I discovered that the jungle proper, beyond the little almost thicket type area I was in before, was way bigger than that previous area, with multiple divergent paths, a huge scar cut in the world at its center for lore reasons that I don't fully understand yet, and a bunch of scary encounters like the previously mentioned lightning dinos. The game truly opens up at this point, and in the seven hours I've played thus far, I'm nowhere near seeing everything in town, let alone exploring the areas beyond. I don't know how much content is in the game at the moment, however, I would not be surprised if there was a lot more beyond this, and I'm extremely excited to find out. Now, of course, I hear, again, a lot of you out there shouting from the rooftops, a huge world to explore means nothing if there's nothing to find, and you know what? Yeah, I agree. I'm totally with you. I cannot stand a game that makes its world as big as possible and has nothing to put in it. But that's the beauty of the way the Guild Saga is structured. It's big and it's sprawling in certain ways, sure, but it's also designed, and rewards have been placed within that design that are always pushing you forward. Every box, every body, every chest, and every path has the potential to have a cool new sword, or a spell book, or money, to say nothing of the potential side quests, hidden paths, scary enemies, boss encounters. You know, it's not to the level of the demo, which clearly spammed super high-level gear into easy-to-find places to give you an idea of what the build crafting game would be like in the end game. You do still find a lot of gear just through exploration that gives you plenty of options, giving you different abilities, different types of stats, kind of letting you lean into different aspects of perhaps even the same skill tree, right? There's options there and it's really nice. And that's to say nothing of some of the real centerpiece options that you can buy from shops if you decide to pool your money and pick up a really nice toy for one of your characters. You're rewarded for exploring here in a way that's just, it's so satisfying. Again, I gotta go back to that lightning dino fight that I keep mentioning, right? What's crazy is that was a complete side path. Like, it was set up in dialogue back in town with numerous NPCs. The smaller enemies that featured in the fight actually served as mini-bosses in fights leading up to it. But it was also a complete side area that I only stumbled upon because I was too damn scared to deal with whatever the hell these things are on the main path. And then I got the flesh fried from my bones by lightning dinosaurs for my trouble, and that's, I mean... Honestly, pretty awesome. <laughs> like, seriously, if this is the pace of discovery 
item acquisition, character growth, and world building that the game maintains for its entire run, you won't hear me stop talking about it. It's going to be awesome. Now, as far as the writing and lore of Guild Saga are concerned, I'm just as pleased here as I was in my initial coverage of the game. There is a charm to the writing in this game that I really appreciate and certainly was not expecting first going into it. Not only does every character feel distinct from main party members to generic NPCs, but there's an attention to detail that is always satisfying. For example, I unlocked an entire tree of dialogue with a merchant early in the game in the demo simply because he and I were both devil folk, and I learned a fair bit of lore that I wouldn't otherwise have done. Your party will also comment on and react to a lot of your choices you might expect from a much larger AAA RPG title, which I love to see. Like, yeah, you'll start to get a read on which character will like which option as you learn who they are. You know, the classic, well, this character will disapprove of you doing anything other than adopting all the puppies from the local care center, whereas this character will only be happy with you if you burn the entire thing down with everyone inside, right? But that's the case with pretty much any title like this. It's also kind of like real life to a degree. So I enjoy that aspect as well. The fact that you can learn something about Asuka's backstory only to have a separate but related topic come up later, which you can use for your knowledge of her history to navigate in a way that makes her feel she can trust you is the kind of satisfying use of dialogue that caused me to love games like Triangle Strategy and Baldur's Gate 3. And its presence here is a boon for sure. That said, what really has me intrigued is the world building. I said before that I'm more engaged in the story due to the fact that we're living through the exact kind of, a quote, battle of gods and demons in the heavens, unquote, that usually serves as the backdrop of this kind of fantasy story. But I'm really kind of underselling it here. Everything happening in Guild Saga is directly related to the fact that just a few days ago, the God of Light's steed and right-hand knight were struck from the sky by a great darkness, plummeting to the land below and crashing on the very island we're making our way towards. We are living through an apocalyptic event, and the further you proceed, the more evident that is. First, it's unnaturally violent storms that maroon your party on the island. Then it's nightmarish dreams where people you just met are dying horribly at the hands of demons, and a mysterious girl proclaims it's too late to do anything about it. Then, you hear about the wildlife mutating, becoming more aggressive. Nature gods start speaking to you, reports roll in of vegetation gaining sentience and dragging off screaming victims, and you meet the exact girl you saw in your dreams, who's just a normal, almost kind of rough and tumble pirate. So, like, what the hell happens with her? Then you start seeing farm animals are getting sick, and it's only once your druidic companion says, hey, we can talk to them because of my powers, that you're able to speak to them while they look at you with their dead eyes and whisper prophetic words of chaos and death directly into your mind. Then there's hushed mutters in the tavern, where it speak of humanoid figures with too many limbs stalking the trees outside the town walls. Things are degenerating fast here. And it all has to do with this apparent godly demise. And to me, that's so freaking cool, man. Like, I'm used to these types of events being what shaped the world your character is currently living in. That's why I said at the top of the video, like, yeah, you might interact with it a little bit. Maybe even fix what happened centuries ago to eventually wind up saving the world. But it's not often I play a game where there's a war in the heavens happening right now. And your ragtag group of adventurers needs to navigate the chaos that follows as it happens and hopefully get a little bit of divine intervention along the way because I don't know how else you're supposed to survive. Like, I don't know if you'll have the same reaction to this as me, but I am truly enamored with this world and can't wait to see how events progress. A couple points to wrap up here. I do want to talk about the graphics and the music because similarly to my feelings regarding the writing, my opinion towards Guild Saga's graphics and music has really only improved with time. At first, the kind of very tall and slender design of the playable cast is a little odd to me proportionally, but as I've progressed, I've encountered so many NPCs of all shapes and sizes, and it's really brought the world to life. As far as animations are concerned, I'm in love. Everything feels like it's just simple enough to be efficient, but fancy and ornate enough to be satisfying. Attacks hit hard, spells look flashy, and the battlefield environments are both easy to read and yet also detailed and varied. NBC animations are even better, walking into town and seeing a wide variety of characters fishing, cooking, eating, or nervously swinging their weapons kind of brings the place to life while you navigate it. And there's something to be said for this attention to detail. Like, you probably aren't going to stand around and watch an idle animation of an NPC unless you're, like me, doing so for work while also being unhealthily interested in my new game design decisions, but your brain will notice it unconsciously. And that unconscious notice will leave you feeling 
more or less satisfied with a game depending on how much it engages with it. If it doesn't have it, it can be a little disappointing. It can leave a game feeling a little hollow or soulless and people are just kind of standing around waiting for you to talk to them, right? This is not the way that Guild Saga is, where just these little animations, these little added bits of detail, bring a lot of satisfying life to the world of the game in a way that I feel is very important, especially when you're rocking a pixel style that relies a lot on its visual presentation and its style. Switching over to the music and sound design, this is still another one of my favorite aspects of the game. Every track is so full of life and energy, even the more foreboding sort of inside tracks that I kind of would expect from a game that is suffused with this sense of tropical adventure that you would think of, of like an island romp, right? Like for example, I hadn't played this game since I covered the demo in February, over six months ago, but immediately a smile crossed my face when the menu music started and then when I heard the combat music, and I've really not grown tired of it at all yet in any of the tracks, which I'm very happy about. Meanwhile, the combat sound effects are also very nice. Nothing to like super write home about, I would say. It's not too much. They have just enough impact to be felt while not being distracting. It lets me continue to enjoy the music and the world while also giving me that sense of impact when I'm hitting stuff. And to me, that's exactly what the position of a, any sort of sound effect should be in. I want to wrap up here by discussing what's changed from the demo release, as well as a couple of critiques that I have about Guild Saga. Nothing major, just kind of little sticking points that I'd like to see potentially smoothed over in future updates. First off, the changes. My number one critique of the demo was how combat had a sort of sticky feeling to it at times. What I mean by that is that it felt like there was almost a, like a cooldown between using actions, especially the same action on the same target in quick succession. There were times in the demo where I had to confirm an action multiple times before the animation would trigger, or where I would even need to go back and forth and repeatedly click or use the hotkeys to trigger an ability that was already live just to get it to actually go off. It was as if there was like some sort of internal cooldown to load assets or just like some sort of lack of registration of inputs, but I'm happy to say that now that's gone. I can sit there and spam three attacks in a row with my warrior slapping a target with no delay or cast multiple spells in quick succession with no interruption. And combat really feels buttery smooth as a result of this. It keeps the pace of combat really high. And I'm really glad to see that this was addressed. There's also been a bunch of new dialogue added from the narrator between scenes and after major events that adds depth to the world and gives a little bit more context to the player now. It's always a delicate balance to add extra written dialogue in between action sequences or other things that are happening so as to not be overly wordy and break up the gameplay while still making sure that the player is kept up to date. But I feel like this addition in Guild Saga walks that line very nicely. You can also no longer chat with your team when you're in an active combat area. Area. This is a change that surprised me a bit as I was used to chatting up at the party whenever I felt like. Now though, they'll chastise you and ask you to wait until you're back in town where it's safe before you strike up a conversation. And I mean, yeah, like in universe, it makes perfect sense. But I do wonder how this will impact character growth and your ability to learn about the team over the course of the whole game if you have far more limited opportunities to actually start talking with them. Finally, there's been some dialogue changes that are relatively low impact, largely regarding NPCs and side quests, and it tends to involve a character's motivation for doing what they've done. I'm assuming that this has to do with overall narrative tweaks, and I only bring it up since I kind of liked some of the original dialogue a little bit more. For example, there's this pirate that you can find early on, who you can actually convince you to battle alongside you against the crew that he abandoned. Originally in the demo, he left when he saw that the crew had started taking children to sell on the black market. Whereas now, he's more vague and simply says that he couldn't stomach the crew's actions any longer, essentially. It's a change that functionally really doesn't impact anything much. But for me, knowing the kind of specific depths of the evils that this pirate crew had sunk to made me personally all the more eager to take them down. It's really not a huge deal, but again, to me, it mattered a little bit, so I figured I'd mention it. I closed my previous video by stating that I've absolutely be continuing to follow Guild Saga Vanished Worlds as it continues to develop, including and beyond its release, so long as it continues to live up to the kind of standards set by the demo. Now that that release is here, I'm so pleased to see that the team at Ocelot is continuing to deliver an experience that I can't recommend highly enough. I've loved playing every second that I have of Guild Saga thus far. I want to learn where the story is going. I want to play with so many different builds. I want to be challenged by so many more interesting combat encounters. And I'm feeling very positive that I'll be getting everything I want here and more. 
If you're at all interested in checking out Guild Saga Vanished Worlds, I do have a link to the Steam page in the description below. At time of recording, there is a demo, so check that out. And then if you enjoy that hands-on experience, consider picking it up and supporting the devs. I know I plan on playing way more of it in the future, whether on my own or on stream. So if this is a game that you'd like to see more coverage of in the future, whether it be streams, videos, what have you, let me know in the comments, like the video. Those are great metrics for me to gauge interest so I can plan future content. Thank you once again to Ocelot and Vicarious for sponsoring the video. Thank you to all of you for watching. Until the next time, my name has been Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman. I hope you all have a good night, stay safe and healthy out there, and remember, be good to each other. Bye now.